Joe Biden has given a rare address to the nation. He has asked for $100 billion. Zelensky wins this jackpot. A lot of people wondered how much would be going to Israel, how much would be going to Ukraine. And he's announced $60 billion for Ukraine and $10 billion, but it's fluctuating. It's a fluctuating number, $10 billion to Israel. And the remainder would go to um, the U.S.-Mexico border, I believe, as well as some other places uh, that uh, that some of where some of the money needs to go. So there's going to be some other places where this money will flood. Uh, this is meant to make everybody happy. So this is meant to make the Democrats happy, which obviously Joe Biden's a Democrat, and they really want to see a lot of funding for Ukraine. So that is where that big chunk of money is going to be going to Zelensky, that $60 billion. Of course, there's Republicans who want to see money going to Israel, uh, Democrats and Republicans for that matter. And so, um, but majority definitely staunch Republicans wanting that, a lot of Democrats wanting that, a lot of bipartisanship for Israel. So they know that if they package this together, that they're going to get more um, money sent to Israel if they package it, or money sent to Ukraine if they package it alongside Israel to also make Republicans happy, money for the U.S.-Mexico border. So let's go ahead and watch a little bit of why Biden says we need to be engaging in more wars. Here it is. Let me close with this. Earlier this year, I boarded Air Force One for a secret flight to Poland. There I boarded a train with blacked out windows for a 10 hour ride each way to Kyiv to stand with the people of Ukraine ahead of the one year anniversary of their brave fight against Putin. And I'm told I was the first American to enter a war zone not controlled by the United States military since President Lincoln. With me was just a small group of security personnel and a few advisors. But when I exited that train and met Zelensky, President Zelensky, I didn't feel alone. I was bringing with me the idea of America, the promise of America, to the people who are today fighting for the same things we fought for 250 years ago. Freedom, independence, self-determination. And as I walked through Kyiv with President Zelensky, with air raid sirens sounding in the distance, I felt something I've always believed, more strongly than ever before. America is a beacon to the world, still, still. Whereas my friend Madeleine Albright said, the indispensable nation. Tonight, there are innocent people all over the world who hope because of us, who believe in a better life because of us, who are desperate not to be forgotten by us and are waiting for us. But time is of the essence. I know we have our divisions at home. <clears throat> we have to get past them. We can't let petty, partisan, angry politics get in the way of our responsibility as a great nation. We cannot and will not let terrorists like Hamas and tyrants like Putin win. I refuse to let that happen. In moments like these, we have to remind, we have to remember who we are. We are the United States of America. The United States of America. And there is nothing, nothing beyond our capacity if we do it together. My fellow Americans, thank you for your time. May God bless you all. May God protect our troops. Okay, so uh, this is why we need to continue funding and giving our money to other countries rather than dealing with the problems that we have in our own country, the, uh, the, the dwindling middle class, people just being more broke, riddled with high housing costs, skyrocketing food, skyrocketing gas, all, uh, never mind any of that, we are America. And we need to be fighting for democracy around the world. So this is what Joe Biden says is the reason for why the justification for why they're funding. There's going to be increased funding for Ukraine, why we're going to be continuing giving money to Israel, even more money this time around to Israel. It is because we are fighting for freedom, independence, self-determination, the idea of America, a promise is what he says. We're going to get a little deeper into that because there's a lot of reasons why people feel like there is justification for going to war or supporting war or funneling arms to other groups. But uh, before I get to that, I want to show you how much money we've already given to Ukraine. So $60 billion is a significant, significant amount. Um, according to the CFR, we have given uh, this much money to Ukraine at this point. There's uh, 70, they're claiming that at this juncture, it's a little hard to, to totally know. This was from 
January 24th of 2022 to July 31st of 2023. They're saying, according to the CFR, that the U.S. government has given $76.8 billion. Now, that is what Congress has um, set aside and given to Ukraine. It's unclear if there's more money that has been given. There's a lot of different ways that money gets gets funneled over to a country. So um, some of it is through congressional approval. Some of it is through already budgeted money for the Pentagon, and then that gets shipped off. So it's probably a bit more than this, but $76.8 billion is what we know of going up to July 31st of this year. So $60 billion to Ukraine is nearly what we've already given them up to this point in the war. That is significant. That is significant, significant. Now, I know Zelensky was probably holding his breath, wondering, has the world just completely turned their back on Ukraine? They were getting all this attention for so long and a flood of money from all the different Western nations. And now that all eyes are on Israel, is Ukraine going to be left in the dust? And that was a big question a lot of people had. We haven't heard about the war anymore. We're not getting those gruesome updates all the time of, of, of we, depending on the narrative that you're paying attention to, right? We're not getting those updates anymore. Everything has been on Israel, including this show. We've been just all eyes on Israel at this point. But no fear, Zelensky, don't worry. The U.S. is still going to give you gobs and gobs of money to the tune of $60 billion, nearly what they've already received up to this point of the war. So that is very significant. That's not going to go over well with Republicans in Congress. But what's interesting, and they can't do anything anyway until they get their speakership issue sorted out, which they're still in the middle of doing. Um, but until that is figured out, they can't actually approve any, any of this money. But the point of this money is... When he packaged it smartly, I mean, as, as far as a pol- for political maneuvering goes, this was a very smart way to do it if you want to get support from everyone. And that is, bake it, say, we want $60 billion for Ukraine, plus we want $10 billion, if not more, for Israel, plus we want several billion for the U.S.-Mexico border. So things that Republicans care about are baked into this package so that it's going to be really difficult for them to say no. So that means we're going to be sending a lot more money over to these foreign endless wars. And what we already hear right now is still the rhetoric with Ukraine of we're in it to win it. We're in it to the last day. We're in it until Russia completely abandons the the, the idea and re- retreats completely, including from Crimea and the Donbass areas that they've held since 2014. I want to show you, um, let's actually go ahead and show you this. First of all, I want to show you this Ukraine was really nervous, not only because the world has been shifting the attention to Israel, but also because of this. Here's a scoop from Axios saying that U.S. was to send Israel artillery shells initially designed, uh, destined for Ukraine. So you got the Ukrainians really upset and scared and wondering, now they're getting our ammunition. They're going to get all the money. Oh, no. But Biden apparently called Zelensky before he gave his speech tonight to the nation um, and and let him know, no, we still have your back. We're going to give you $60 billion. And now he then announced it, that that's what he wants to do. So as long as Congress goes along with that plan. I want to show you the map of how the war front's going in Ukraine, because the idea is, you know, if we're going to continue shelling out money, what is the end game here? Um, no matter where you have fallen on the Ukraine-Russia war, perhaps you're very much in defense of Ukraine and you feel like their country's being invaded and they have the right to defend themselves against these invaders, or if you're on the side where you believe that this was a provoked uh, war, that NATO provoked it, that NATO used Ukraine as a puppet and sacrificed the Ukrainian people, that's where I've stood on this in this war, is that I do think it's wrong for a country to invade. I think that, however, this one was a little bit complicated with Russia and Ukraine because Donetsk, uh, the Donbass region, Crimea, these people are... They, they're linguistically Russian. They identify very much with Russian people. You know, they're speaking Russian. Um, and they they wanted to be with Russia. They really wanted to be independent or they wanted to be with Ukraine, but they just didn't like the way things were going. And so they chose Russia ultimately in referendums. There's a lot of debate about that. But nonetheless, I do believe in people having the right to uh, right to self-determination. And if the people in those regions want to be, if they prefer to be with Russia, then I think it's their right to do so. Um, And I think that we provoked that war. We knew that we were going to be causing some aggression, and um, we poked and poked and poked and poked and used the Ukrainian people as a pawn. 
and now they're in the middle of it. Um, and it's devastating. It's devastating for the civilians, for the, the people who've been conscripted into that war. And we're, we're continuing on this path. And the question is, no matter how you, where you sat on which side was right, which side was wrong, the one question we should all be asking is, what's the end goal here? And unfortunately, those that have been very much staunchly against Russia on this and uh, those that said it was NATO aggression, you know, they would they would call them Putin puppets and say that they were on the side of Russia and uh, or in Putin's pocket or how dare they. Um, but their, their end game has been push Russia completely out of Ukraine. That's not realistic. And we have to have a realistic solution to this at this point. Uh, maybe there was a day when that was possible. Maybe maybe that could have been done and push Russia completely back and take all of Ukraine for Ukraine. And maybe the Russian speakers in the uh, eastern part of Ukraine would have gone along with that had they had different treatment by the Ukrainian nationalist government or the, the factions of the Ukrainian nationalist movements. Um, maybe. But here we are today. And today... This the war is not shifting. We're not seeing battle lines moving. I mean, let's look at the map again here. The battle lines are not moving. Russia controls everywhere that it's controlled for the last year, um, certainly still controlling the Donbass and Crimea. That doesn't look to be changing. Uh, Ukraine, is, the, the little tiny, tiny blue specks on the map are the counteroffensives from Ukraine. They're minimal. They're not making any gains. This is why Biden wants to send them $60 billion. But we should really be asking, is it realistic at this point? We've seen what Ukraine can do. They're exhausted. The people have been fighting. They've conscripted all the citizens they could conscript. So unless NATO is going to actually send troops in to fight against Russia and to push Russia back, this is probably what the map is going to look like for a long time. And so uh, now the, the, the defenders on the Ukraine side, the people who are still for giving all this money to Ukraine and continuing this battle say, well, no, if we stop, then those lines, those red lines are going to keep going further and further and deeper into Ukraine. That's a legitimate argument. Um, what we can do, the only thing we can do is, is do a peace negotiation and hope that both sides actually hold to the peace agreement. That's never a guarantee. You can never guarantee that I, any side is going to hold to a peace agreement. But the only thing you can do is try. You can certainly try, and you can have some sort of consequences written into it if one side chooses to um, to break the agreement and and goes and continues hostilities. You know, of course, there's going to be maybe some fringe groups that might rise up and cause violence or factions or whatever that might happen. But by and large. If the Ukrainian government and the Russian government put down their arms and they actually come to a peace agreement, then that's the best that we could do. I mean, we can't tell the future and we certainly shouldn't be trying to play minority report on that where it's like, well, you know, I'm, I'm certain Russia's just going to keep pushing the line. They're going to keep invading and invading. And so we just have to fight them. You can't tell the future. None of us really can. So. Um, it, but but here we are. We're sending more money and this is going to be endless because those red lines aren't going to back down. And so what are we doing with this? What, why are we not calling for a peace agreement? Why are we not sitting down at the table with Russia at this point and saying, okay, let's stop the fighting. You've now gotten the area that you've gotten. We won't have Ukraine and NATO. We'll keep it a neutral country. Let's back down. Um, that would be the, the more, I think, realistic and appropriate solution. But Good luck on that, right? That's not happening. Biden's just announced $60 billion more for Ukraine. Um, I want to go into this, the the idea of why. So the, the, the notion that Biden put out there tonight was we're fighting this because we're fighting on behalf of democracy. So I want to make sure that the thinking when it comes to when we're engaging in these foreign wars, because I do think that there is a time for war. I don't think that there's never a time. I think that there are some times when you absolutely need to defend your country. You need to defend yourself. I do think that there's times when um, maybe we need to go in and we actually need to help a group of people who are being slaughtered, truly like genuine genocides. 
I do think that if we have the ability to stop genuine genocides, then we go and we do that. This is like what happened with um, Bill Clinton in Bosnia during World War II with the Holocaust, right? If we have the ability to stop genuine human massacre and we see it happening in large scales, then I think that there's maybe a, a moral obligation for countries to get together and do that. And those could be discussed, those could be hashed out. When do we think there is that moral obligation? And that is where things get a little bit murky, right? Because once you start getting into the morality of when should we be getting involved and under what circumstances, then you get to these speeches like what our president just gave us tonight, which is um, we're doing this to preserve democracy. We're doing this for democracy, that people want independence and they want freedom and they want self-determination and so when we see that happening in the world, when we see this injustice or this assault on this democracy and freedom, then that is why we need to rush in. Clearly, a lot of people agree with that sentiment in this country because we've got a lot of Americans who are not, you know, your average American citizen is not bought off by the military industrial complex. Maybe our politicians are. Maybe much of the lobbying and the industry of Washington, D.C. is funded by the military industrial complex, but the average person is not. The average person is watching the news and they're being fed a certain amount of information or certain certain um, viewpoints only. I mean, I was watching Fox News all day today and all I got was poor Israel, poor Israel, poor Israel um, and oh, a little bit of poor Palestine. You know, there are some civilians there, but ultimately it was very much a one sided conversation. I turn on CNN, I see the same thing. It's very much one sided when it comes to that particular conflict. When it comes to Russia, Ukraine, you turn on CNN, it's very one-sided. You turn on MSNBC, it's very one-sided. So people are just getting one part of the news based on, and every news person is biased. Every news organization clearly is biased, but people should be able to recognize this and they should be able to flip around from channel to channel or person to person and kind of get different perspectives. Um, but there's certainly a lot of American people who agree that we have to defend democracy. And that's why these average people, when they're watching CNN and MSNBC or whatever it is they're watching, they say, yeah, we have to go in there and we have to help. We have to help the Ukrainians because we have to prevent, we have to uh, protect democracy and prevent this fascist autocratic regime of Russia coming in and taking that away from them. Many of the people then, they use that same logic when it comes to Israel and they say, the democracy of Israel, and this is where Joe Biden gets at, this is where I'll give him credit, it is a consistent argument. So, in the, and this is what we're gonna get into here in just a minute, the consistency of arguments. This is a consistent argument to say, well, somewhat, it's somewhat consistent, to say we are protecting democracy. We are protecting liberal democracy. So you have to be, you have to put a caveat on that. Like what kind of, because he says we're, we're wanting to protect freedom and independence and self-determination. Well, that's what the Palestinian people are, are wanting. Now, when you then say, no, we're actually we're fighting to protect liberal democracy. OK, then then that's maybe where you get into the why you would pick the side of Israel over the Palestinian people, because Israel has, I wouldn't say a, by any means, uh, a liberal democracy by Western standards. I'd say it's definitely closer, for sure. It's definitely, definitely much closer to a Western nation than Palestine, for sure. Palestine is definitely more conservative and uh, definitely less liberal, less free. There's no doubt about that in my mind. So if you are going to go down the path of we want to fight these wars because we are fighting for liberal democracy, to spread liberal democracy around the world, then I suppose it makes sense for you to side with Ukraine somewhat. I, I suppose it makes sense for you to side with Israel somewhat, right? So we're seeing, but then we see a lot of the hypocrisy in the arguments uh, where we see people that are siding with, you know, they don't side with Ukraine. They do believe that NATO was an aggressor, that uh, Russia invaded because of NATO expansion, NATO aggression. They didn't want to see NATO bases with nuclear weapons on their border. And so you got a lot of people who are very critical of that. And then as soon as the Israel-Palestine conflict breaks out, they side unequivocally with Israel. And they say it doesn't, you know, Israel has the right to defend itself. 
And yet when it comes to Ukraine and people were saying, well, Ukraine has the right to defend themselves, these same people would say, well, no, they don't because uh, the, the, there was NATO aggression. Totally ignoring the aggression against the Palestinian people that have been going on for 75 years. These people were living there and a group of immigrants literally flooded onto the shores and said, we're reclaiming our birthright that we were born here 2,000 years ago. I don't know anybody who's 2,000 years old, but they said, we were given this 2,000 years ago. It is our land. We're back, whether you like it or not. And this is ours, and you need to go and immigrate away from this particular lot of land. You need to go to Jordan. You need to go to Egypt. You need to go somewhere else. But you can't be here because this is just going to be a land for one group of people and one group of people only, and that group is not you. You're not in that group, so you got to go. So that group of people, the Palestinian people, have been fighting back, saying you can't take our land. We've been here for hundreds of years. This is crazy. And this is, you know, a bunch of Russian USSR immigrants, actually, ironic, right, that showed up on the shore and said, we're going to take this. So it, it, now this is where it gets tricky, right? And because you've got the Russian aggression where Russians are going into Ukraine and saying – we don't want really their reasoning wasn't we're taking this land because this land belongs to us. I suppose they could have gone down that road with reasoning, right? They could have said, well, we're taking this land because it was the old USSR. That is what a lot of people on the on the left who really support Ukraine. That's what they say Russia's true intention is. They're saying it doesn't matter what Russia says about NATO expansion. We're not listening to that. What we're hearing is they want to build back the USSR. They want to take all the USSR land back, and that is what their real intention is. And so that is what we have to protect Ukraine from. That is consistent. I just, you know, I'm just pointing this out. This is consistent if you are pro-Ukraine and you're pro-Palestine. That is actually a consistent argument to say it's about the land grab. If you genuinely believe that Russia's invasion into Ukraine had nothing to do with NATO expansion. It wasn't about that at all, but it was about the USSR just wanting to reclaim itself and take land. Then it is consistent to be pro-Ukraine and to also be pro-Palestine. You see where I'm going with this? For me, my the reasoning for me is I believe in self-determination of people. So I think groups of people should be able to determine who they want to be with, who they want to be controlled by. I don't think that a person, and this goes consistent with my COVID viewpoints, um, where I, I don't believe that I should be controlled by an entity that I don't want to be controlled by. I don't want the government to come in and tell me that I have to, to behave a certain way or do certain things. I believe in self-determination. I believe in that sort of freedom and that liberty. And I do think that there's the people in Dunbas uh, they have the they should and Crimea they should have the right to choose which government they want to be ruled under. I believe that the Palestinian people have the right to choose which government they want to be ruled under, and they don't want to be ruled under the Israeli government. They're under occupation of the Israeli government. And they don't want to be under that. So people should have the right to determine their the self determination is really where I drive a lot of my my opinions from. Now, I could at times be a hypocrite. Um, there, there may be times that I might find that I have an inconsistency in which side do I support of any one conflict. When you think about the one conflict, there I might find some inconsistencies. And if I do find those and I try to correct those inconsistencies because I can't stand, I can't stand hypocrisy. It's just my big thing. I, I can respect you if I, I could disagree with you on everything. But if you're, as long as your logic is consistent, then I can, I can be on board with it. I could say, okay, you know, I mean, I don't agree with it, but I can at least respect that it's a clear and, and non-hypocritical way of thinking. It's what gets me is the hypocrisy. So what I'm seeing right now, for example, when I was watching Fox News all day today, was I was seeing them say, we've got to go in there and disarm Hamas, go in there and disarm, you know, get, just get all of their weapons and the Palestinian people shouldn't have weapons. The, uh, Hamas definitely shouldn't have weapons. And then at the same time, they're saying we've got to arm the Israeli people. And they, of course, say, and the American people should be armed as well, that, that we have a Second Amendment right to defend ourselves against a tyrannical government. 
And I found that so hip hypocritical to listen to when you've got the Palestinian people who feel like they're under an oppressive, tyrannical government, whether it be Hamas, if they had guns, maybe they could fight Hamas, or if they want to fight the occupiers, the Israeli government who's occupying their land and who's been pushing them off to, you know, different Arab, Arab areas. All right, guys, when running a business, your employees can create all kinds of interesting situations like getting complaints because someone on the team smells horrible. Well, with Bambi, you're going to get access to your own dedicated HR manager starting at just $99 a month. That's it. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business is compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policy tra and trainings and feedback. And what's great about Bambi is your HR manager is a U.S.-based person dedicated to your business, giving you access to the HR expertise and personal touch you need. HR managers can easily cost 80 grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 a month. And I'll tell you also something, being sued by your employees costs even more than that. So you want to stay HR compliant. Trust me on this one. You really, really do. I've seen lawsuit after lawsuit after, not me personally, thank goodness, but I have witnessed it. Um, many, many lawsuits because of HR compliance issues. And it just comes down to you just want compliant and now you owe hundreds of thousands of dollars. You don't want to be that person. So schedule your free com conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Kim Iverson under podcast when you sign up. That'll help out the show. That's spelled Bambi, B-A-M-B-E-E. -E. Not, not uh, Bambi like the, the deer, but Bambi.com. That link is down below. Type in Kim Iverson under podcast.